Hi there. We have been discussing uh, in the various videos regarding the uh, challenges faced by the body in the form of unusual environments. For instance, high barometric pressure or low barometric pressure or gravitational forces and so on. Let's see how the physiological systems uh, cope the challenges related to the temperature, temperature surrounding the body. So let's first understand what is a normal body temperature and what are its types and how the body can uh, cope with the extremes of temperatures. So the normal body temperature, uh, basically it's of two types. One is called as core temperature. The temperature deep inside, the temperature surrounding the tissues, temperature of the tissues themselves is called as the core temperature. This temperature needs to be kept exactly constant within a very, very narrow range. Just plus or minus 1 degree Fahrenheit, 1 degree Fahrenheit or plus or minus 0 0.6 degree centigrade. It should be maintained in that narrow range. So the normal, range, normal uh, body temperature 90 uh, to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit when measured orally. Whereas the other temperature is called as shell temperature. Okay, let me just add one more line to this core temperature. Why it needs to be kept constant? Obviously, our cells have enzymes and they will work uh, normally if the temperature of the tissues is held within a very narrow range, within that normal range. And therefore, the temperature inside the body, temperature of the tissues, the core temperature needs to be held constant under all circumstances. The other temperature is shell temperature or surface temperature or skin temperature. Now this temperature does vary. It does change according to the ambient temperature. As the surrounding temperature changes, the skin temperature is going to change. But what's more important is the core temperature has to be held constant. How is this achieved? We will see that in the subsequent discussion. But remember, shell temperature can change. It does change with the surrounding temperature, but the core temperature has to be, has to be kept constant. Axillary temperature, you know, uh, temperature is measured from, uh, it can be measured from uh, various areas. So axillary temperature is about 0.3 degrees lower because uh, of the perspiration, the temperature would be slightly lower in the axilla as compared to the oral temperature. Whereas rectal temperature is 0.5 to 1.5 degree centigrade higher than the oral temperature. So uh, these are the variations if you check the temperature from uh, various parts. And remember temperature regulating system is one of the most efficient systems in the body. It's called as homeothermy, I mean regulating the temperature in a very narrow strict range and uh, the temperature regulating system is among the most efficient systems in the body with a very very high gain, the gain of plus 33 is among the highest. Now let's see how is body temperature maintained. It's a balance. Regulation of body temperature is a balance between heat production in the body and heat loss from the body. Heat production, heat loss. And there is a balancing act. And you can imagine, I mean, if the heat production is greater than the heat loss, the body will gain the temperature and the temperature will rise. If the heat loss is more than the heat production, then uh, heat is lost and the body temperature will fall. So it's a perfect balance which is maintained by the temperature regulating system. Let us see these two things, the heat production and the heat loss. And then we'll see how the balance is maintained. Uh, how is heat produced in the body in the first place? Look, 
we eat food stuffs and uh, the energy in those food stuffs is made available to our body tissues and cells now energy efficiency of the cells is said to be only about 20 to 25 percent means the energy that was there in the food stuffs out of that energy only 20 to 25 percent will be actually converted into the usable energy that's atp what about the remaining energy in the food stuffs that will be lost in the form of heat i'm using the word lost but it's actually not lost it's actually to maintain the body temperature that heat which is being generated is actually maintaining our body temperature so but the point is that uh, heat is produced how by the foodstuffs the energy in those foodstuffs some of it is making atps and the remaining is converted into heat it's lost as heat or rather we would say heat is generated well heat is a byproduct of cellular metabolism and therefore if the metabolic rate goes on increasing then uh, of course heat production will also increase so there's something called as bmr even if we were not to perform any physical or mental activity not having had food for last 10 hours still the cells are functioning at their very basal levels and that's called as basal metabolic rate so this basal metabolic rate itself is generating some kind of heat which we saw just now and that heat is maintaining our body temperature basically it's about 65 to 70 calories per hour in a normal 70 kg adult and the factors that influence the bmr will also influence the heat production you know the main uh, uh, factor that influences the bmr is the thyroid hormone so you often see if there is hyperthyroidism, there would be more and more heat production in the body. And therefore, such people will be intolerant to heat. On the other hand, if there is hypothyroidism, then the BMR would be less, heat production will be less in the body, and such people will be intolerant to cold. So, uh, that's one uh, way of producing heat in the body addition to that there is muscle activity we all perform some kind of muscle activity and that is going to produce heat in the body you must have experienced this if you have if you have had a long long day at the uh, and with a lot of physical activity a lot of stressful activity the uh, at the end of the day you feel that body temperature has increased slightly there was an increased heat production in the body so muscle activity of course there is specific dynamic action of the foodstuffs look foodstuffs uh, before they could provide any energy they themselves spend some pre-existing energy when we eat the foods there has to be digestion absorption and assimilation of that those foodstuffs or those that those nutrients rather all that needs some pre-existing energy to be broken down and in the bargain there would be some heat generation as well you will uh, often notice that after eating food body temperature will be slightly increased so specific dynamic action of the foodstuffs and uh, out of the total energy expenditure about 10 to 15 percent expenditure of energy per day is on the breakdown of foodstuffs that we eat and it's called as specific dynamic action of the foodstuffs so even that is uh, going to cause energy expenditure and heat production the other factors of course um, increase metabolism and heat production by testosterone by growth hormone whereas uh, reduced metabolism and reduced heat production is uh, in other physiological uh, condition like uh, sleep for instance during sleep the basal metabolic rate is at at 90% uh, of the maximum so the bmr decreases during sleep and therefore heat production would also decrease during the sleeping hours so that was how that's how heat production occurs in the body now the heat loss mechanisms 
as i said uh, after all body temperature depends on the balance between heat production and heat loss so heat loss mechanism before we discuss this how is heat lost from the body look as the heat is generated by the cellular metabolism and other mechanisms in a two step process heat will be lost out of the body first the heat of the tissues uh, heat uh, or temperature generated by the tissues it via circulation it will come to the surface to the skin and from the skin the second step it is lost to the immediate environment so two step circulation will carry the heat of the heat generated by the body tissues up to the skin and from the skin second step heat is lost to the immediate surrounding so uh, that's how heat is lost uh, from the body having said this let's also understand what are the various heat loss mechanisms from the body four important mechanisms conduction convection radiation and evaporation in no particular order i am just mentioning four uh, different ways of heat loss from the body conduction not so important about uh, 5 to 10% heat loss occurs by conduction how cooler objects if they are touching the body parts then there is direct transfer of heat from the skin to the to the cooler object any cold object any cooler object if it's touch, touching the uh, skin surface heat will be uh, will be lost to that object so that's called as conduction not so important uh, only about 5 to 10% heat loss occurs by conduction then uh, convection well from the skin from the cutaneous blood flow the heat is lost to the immediate surrounding first immediate surrounding of the body and then the air currents the wind and its velocity will carry it further away farther away from the body so that's the heat loss by convection and of course as i have said it will depend on the wind the air flow and its velocity so convection of heat uh, convection is a way of heat loss uh, first the heat is lost to the immediate surrounding and then it is carried away from the body uh, carried further away by the air currents um radiation the most important or the major fraction of heat loss from the body is via radiation heat is lost in the form of infrared rays and it's called as heat loss by radiation so in fact a major proportion major chunk of heat loss occurs by radiation in the form of infrared rays but of course uh, let me add uh, 50% heat loss from the body generally occurs by radiation 30% by evaporation well evaporation of the sweat for instance sweat evaporates from the uh, skin surface and the, the temperature in that area is decreased and then uh, the heat from the other parts of the body is taken to that area and is lost to the surroundings so sweating and evaporation of the sweat so remember athletes are always told that uh, they should not wipe out the sweat immediately as it comes because sweat should be there on the skin and it should evaporate so as to cause heat loss so about 30% of the heat loss occurs by evaporation of sweat from the skin and uh, 15% by convection about 2% or so is lost via excreta also yeah so i was talking about these uh, four important ways the most important is radiation but remember let me just add further about the radiation and heat loss by radiation every object emits heat in the form of this infrared rays now if the surrounding objects are cooler then the body will lose heat to them to those objects and the body temperature will decrease but if 
the surrounding objects have a higher temperature particularly 38 degrees or even higher then those objects will send the heat i mean the, the net transfer of heat will be from those objects to the body and body will start gaining heat if you have ever experienced uh, the very hot environments or uh, heated structures with uh, with the which are made up of asbestos at the top it, it makes the body heat to increase very rapidly because those objects are emitting heat back to the body there is net gain of heat by the body but remember uh, radiation in the form of infrared rays the most important proportion of heat loss okay when the ambient temperature is below 28 degrees then the heat loss by radiation increases further up to 70% of heat loss would be by radiation and as the environmental temperature becomes 38 degree centigrade or greater radiation will not cause heat loss but will cause heat gain as i mentioned just now if the surrounding objects have a temperature of 38 degrees or even more then the body will start gaining heat the net transfer would be from those objects to the body and body will gain heat so in such conditions the heat loss will be mainly by evaporation evaporation of the sweat convection and heat loss well the convection is promoted by movement of air across the body surfaces and for any given air temperature heat losses from a naked body increase with a square of wind velocity up to 60 miles per hour just uh, a technical matter so i mentioned it and sweating how it loses heat 1 ml of water absorbs 0.58 kilocalories during the evaporation and the heat loss at the room temperature is about 17 uh, kilocalories per hour so uh, that's how water or sweat evaporating from the skin will cause heat loss what is the critical temperature for sweating critical temperature for sweating begins at an environmental temperature of environmental temperature of 29 degrees centigrade or a skin temperature of about 34 degrees centigrade so that's called as critical temperature of sweating what will happen if the body is immersed in water mostly the heat loss will occur by convection please remember this if the body is immersed in into the water then radiation and evaporation cannot occur heat loss cannot occur by radiation or evaporation and in that case mostly the heat loss would occur by convection the currents of water will take the heat away from the body now acclimatization to the heat if you have gone into a heat a uh, hot region hot climate how do you acclimatize and how long does it take it takes about 7 to 14 days and the changes are as follows there is increased peripheral heat conductance so uh, blood flow to the skin will increase and uh, thereby heat loss from the skin will also increase increase sweating capacity and yes this is the most important part of acclimatization to hot climate i am talking about the fact how we adapt to the hot climate acclimatization increase sweating capacity with a fall in nacl concentration uh, of the sweat look if if the sweating increases there is going to be loss of water and loss of sodium and chloride in the sweat now this is likely to cause electrolyte imbalance and therefore as a as a process of acclimatization what happens is the sweat volume will increase but the sodium chloride secretion into the, uh, into the sweat will decrease so there will be no loss of sodium chloride and then there will be rise in skin temperature but fall in the core temperature that is how we will acclimatize to the heat 
remember thermal regulatory responses to the heat are activated by thermosensors in the hypothalamus i am making an important uh, statement here physiologically very important the thermal regulatory responses when we face the heat those responses are activated by the thermosensors in the hypothalamus whereas responses to the cold are initiated by thermoreceptors in the skin please remember there are thermal receptors in the skin and hypothalamic neurons uh, in the anterior and posterior hypothalamus they are having thermosensors and there is a hypothalamic thermostat the temperature regulating center of the hypothalamus so when the body faces heat and uh, we need to regulate the body temperature then hypothalamus and its receptors will play, play a key role you know why the reason is very obvious body temperature is about 38 degree centigrade normally and uh, when we face heat the environmental temperature is still likely to be closer to the body temperature isn't it how much heat uh, can be there in the ambient uh, or uh, or in the surroundings so uh, it would be very close to that body temperature 38 degree centigrade is the body temperature and hot climate would still be closer to the body temperature whereas when we face cold temperature it could be extremes of cold it would go to the 0 degree centigrade or even in minus that's too far away from the normal body temperature and therefore those responses when we when the body faces cold they are initiated by the thermoreceptors in the skin skin uh, uh, or therm uh, cutaneous thermoreceptors will initiate strong responses when we face the cold just adding to uh, to this particular point hypothalamus has two sets of neurons one in the anterior hypothalamus one in the posterior hypothalamus for instance posterior hypothalamus uh, dorso medial portion of the posterior hypothalamus has the center for shivering so what happens is when we face the cold and thermal uh, receptors in the skin they are activated they send impulses uh, to the cns and to the hypothalamus now basically blood temperature has fallen as we face the cold so hypothalamic neurons they send uh, neurons in the posterior hypothalamus they will sense this fall of temperature of the blood and they will induce shivering and that's how heat will be generated in the body because the blood temperature was falling core temperature was falling on the other hand if there is uh, heat which is uh, which, uh, if the person is facing hot climate then again blood temperature increases and it is sensed by the anterior hypothalamus and then it will uh, this will lead to cutaneous vasodilation and sweating so heat will be lost from the body now coming to exposure to the cold so far we have seen when the body is exposed to the heat the hot environment how the body will react and how the temperature is regulated now let's see exposure to the cold and reaction to the uh, reaction of the body to that cold temperature there are three things that can happen uh when there is acute exposure to the cold three processes or three events will occur one is cutaneous vasoconstriction now uh basically we have already seen this that how is heat lost from the body heat from the inner organs is taken to the skin so cutaneous blood flow increases and uh, then then via skin 
the heat will be transferred to the surroundings. If more blood flow goes into the skin, if the cutaneous blood flow increases, more and more heat will be lost from the body. When we face cold, we don't want that to happen. And therefore, first and the foremost is there will be cutaneous vasoconstriction. Less and less blood flow going to the skin, so less and less heat lost to the body. Heat needs to be conserved now because uh, the body is facing cold stress. Second is there would be shivering and the third would be release of epinephrine. So three important events when the body faces cold challenge. Cutaneous vasoconstriction, reduced blood supply to the skin, then shivering and release of ep epinephrine. Let's uh, quickly go through these three responses. Cutaneous vasoconstriction begins at a skin temperature of about 15 degrees centigrade. So, uh, imagine that there is a extreme cold environment to which the body was suddenly exposed and the skin temperature begins to fall immediately. At about 15 degrees centigrade of the skin temperature, there would be cutaneous vasoconstriction. It will decrease the blood flow to the skin and heat transfer via skin will be minimized. But in fact, there is one more thing that happens with this. Blood is diverted from the shell to the core. Blood is diverted from the skin to the inner organs. So blood flow to the inner organs will increase. Central blood reservoir will increase. And therefore what happens is because of this, there is something called as cold diuresis. Remember increased blood flow to the inner organs. The renal blood flow has increased. The blood flow to the other organs has increased. This results in what is called as cold diuresis. So urine volume will increase. Second uh, event is cold stress induces shivering thermogenesis. Sometimes called as thermogenic shivering or shivering thermogenesis. Look, what happens here is there is involuntary rhythmic muscular contractions. Muscular contractions happen in a very involuntary and rhythmic fashion. Now these contractions in the form of shivering, uh, I mean uh, causing shivering to appear, they will produce heat in the body. Muscle metabolism will increase, heat production in the body will increase. So that is uh, called as shivering thermogenesis. These muscle contractions are said to be initiated by two descending tracts, the rubrospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract. These are the two uh, extra pyramidal descending tracts and they are known to produce these rhythmic shivering uh, oscillatory type of muscle contractions that generate heat. Shivering begins at an ambient temperature of about 23 degrees centigrade. So, if you are facing 23 degrees centigrade or less, it will induce shivering. But remember, core temperature of 30 to 35 degrees centigrade will cause shivering. And then, if the core temperature falls below 32 degrees, it's supposed to, it's a, it's a medical emergency. If the core temperature has gone so low, it becomes a medical emergency. Up to 35 degrees, it's going to cause intense, intense shivering. And the third event is epinephrine release. Now, this epinephrine is known to cause glycogenolysis in the muscle. So, glycogen breakdown in the muscle, muscle metabolism will increase and heat production will increase. So, these three events are going to cause increase heat production in the body and decreased heat loss from the body. Yeah, we have reduced uh, blood flow to the skin will reduce the heat loss from the body and the other two events will increase heat production. Talking about the shivering thermogenesis, as we have already mentioned, shivering begins at an ambient temperature of 23 degrees centigrade and the center for shivering, which I mentioned just now, 
dorsomedial portion of the posterior hypothalamus. Just remember, anterior hypothalamus and its neurons have a uh, center for heat and posterior hypothalamus is the center for cold. So, uh, when this center is activated, there would be thermogenic shivering. What is the limit for shivering? Uh, shivering induced heat production can only increase the heat by up to three folds, not more than that. It has got limitation because what happens is because of the shivering and those muscle contractions, there is increase in the local skin temperature. Muscles are contracting. So, the skin surface above those muscle contractions would also have an increased temperature and that uh, will cause a greater skin temperature would cause increased heat loss to the environment. So, uh, which, which is undesirable. We wanted to uh, conserve the heat which is produced in the body and protect the body tissues. Their temperature needs to be kept constant. But uh, shivering has a limitation. I told you just now. One is as the muscles shiver, muscles contract, the local skin temperature also is going to increase and there would be heat transfer to the surrounding, heat loss to the surrounding. And the second is uh, those shaking motions during the shivering will increase some amount of heat loss by convection because there is a shaking motion. As, as we said just now, some time back, that uh, convection is because of those air currents. Even these shaking motions may cause some amount of heat loss, which is undesirable. We want to conserve the heat. Uh, let me draw your attention to a, an important area, the newborns and the infants and their temperature regulation. First of all, always remember that the newborns and the infants, they are always at a risk of hypothermia. Look, from a uh, from a warm and moist environment in the womb, inside the uterus, when the baby is delivered, uh, it's coming to a dry and cold environment. And therefore, there is going to be, first, the uh, uh, infant is also in a relative hypoxic situation. And the second one is, there is a greater risk of hypothermia. Why is that? The risk is because of the fact that infants have high ratio of surface area to volume. Remember, infants have a greater ratio of surface area of the body to volume. Look, heat loss to the environment is proportional to the surface area. I mean, more the surface area of the skin, more will be the heat loss. So, remember, heat loss from the body is proportional to the surface area. But Heat production is proportional to the volume. And what did we say just now? There is high ratio of surface area to the volume in case of infants. So, their heat production is going to be less and heat loss is going to be more. Greater surface area, so heat loss is greater and lesser volume, so heat production is less. And therefore, they will lose greater amount of heat from the body. They are likely to suffer from hypothermia. They are at a risk of suffering from hypothermia. So, to prevent this, they have been gifted with something. And that is brown adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue bat or brown fat. Uh, infants and newborn babies, they have a lot of brown fat and that brown fat will cause non-shivering thermogenesis. Remember, in adults, we saw there is going to be shivering thermogenesis when exposed to uh, cold. But newborn baby has this additional protection, brown adipose tissue. Uh, by the way, in adults also, there is some amount of brown adipose tissue or brown fat. Uh, 
just about 10 to 15 percent of the total fat may be brown adipose uh, tissue the remaining one is yellow generally the adults have this brown adipose tissue between the shoulder blades blades or in the nape of the neck and so on now what is the importance of this brown adipose tissue when the newborn baby will face the cold stress there is going to be increased release of norepinephrine i am coming to this importance of brown adipose tissue there would be increased release of norepinephrine and norepinephrine uh, it activates the enzyme deiodinase so what happens is t4 because of this deiodinase enzyme it's converted into t3 the thyroxine the thyroid hormone will be converted into t3 with removal of one iodine and now this t3 will act locally in this brown fat and it upregulates a protein in this brown fat which is called as uncoupling protein remember uh, normally in our mitochondria the ATP production is coupled to the oxidative phosphorylation now this uncoupling protein or UCP1 will uncouple these two processes what it does is that it dissipates the H plus gradient across the mitochondrial membrane if you remember your biochemistry it is this H plus gradient across the mitochondrial membrane which is then going to be uh, the basis for ATP production but this gradient is dissipated so uh, instead of ATP generation most of that energy will be converted into heat and uh, that will increase the body temperature so this is called as non shivering thermogenesis just quickly I would uh, explain once again if it was not very clear brown fat is responsible for non shivering thermogenesis and generation of heat by non shivering mechanism how because brown fat will have this UCP uncoupling protein also called as thermogenin because it is going to generate heat and uh, because of this uh, increased expression of uncoupling protein uh, instead of ATP production most of the energy will be diverted to heat generation and that is how uh, non shivering thermogenesis will produce heat as I mentioned adults have uh, very little brown fat so this is mostly for mainly for uh, the infants and the newborn babies who are exposed to cold environment outside the uterus other responses when there is acute exposure to cold release of ACTH after all cold is a stress and you know uh, glucocorticoids cortisol are, it's a stress hormone so there will be increased release of ACTH and increased uh, levels of cortisol circulating cortisol levels will increase behavioral modification yes clothing um, you know more uh, layers of clothing around the body they would help how because between the two layers air is trapped and air acts as an insulator air being the bad conductor heat will not be lost uh, from the body to the surroundings same is the effect of uh, pilo erection goose bumps not so much important uh, in humans some of these uh, temperature regulating mechanisms are not important in humans uh, let me just uh, uh, digress from the topic a little bit in the uh, hot climate how the lower animals uh, survive how they reduce their body temperature by a mechanism called as panting you might have observed it in dogs they put out their tongue and they exhale rapidly heavily so saliva evaporates from uh, the surface of the tongue and the local area uh, temperature decreases 
and then body heat from one by one place is taken to that area and lost to the surroundings that or the blood temperature is decreased in that manner so that's in lower animals similarly pilo erection when the, uh, when we face cold stress there is uh, there are goose bumps or pilo erection again this is not so important in humans just as uh, panting was not important in humans for a uh, hot climate this will be important in hairy animals when there is pilo erection there is a layer of air trapped in those hair on the skin and as i mentioned just now air is an insulator is a bad conductor so heat is not transferred heat is not lost to the surroundings uh heat is conserved in the body so that's uh, how the body behaves to conserve the heat when uh when it is facing the cold environment cold climate acute exposure to cold uh will generate all these responses let me just add one more reaction called as lewis's hunting reaction just uh for academic interest that there is alternating vasoconstriction and vasodilation observed when a when a person faces cold environment now basically we saw just now that acute exposure to cold should cause cutaneous vasoconstriction yes it will conserve the heat in the body but then what will happen is in the local region oxygen will be taken out by the tissues oxygen will be consumed and because of the vasoconstriction new oxygen is not reaching that area so the region becomes hypoxic and hypoxia leads to vasodilation so what is going to happen vasoconstriction initially when the body faces cold uh, climate acute exposure to cold but it might give way to vasodilation because of the hypoxia new blood not reaching in that region resulting in the local hypoxia and the vasodilation particularly this is seen in those regions like palms for instance or any such regions where uh, there are arteriovenous anastomosis seen so uh, that's uh, an additional fact just remember one more point uh, related to the regulation of body temperature reducing the body temperature below 23 degree centigrade may result in loss of heat regulation by depression of the neural controls neural controls will decrease if the core temperature has fallen uh, way too much and uh, this is the near this is near the low temperature of the lethal limit so remember low temperature of the lethal limit for the body temperature it's 23 degree centigrade and the upper temperature lethal limit is about 43 degree centigrade so 23 43 degrees these are the extremes of temperature which are said to be lethal and in either cases death occurs by cardiac failure now having said all this how do we acclimatize to cold acclimatization to cold also occurs over 2 to 3 weeks it occurs slowly but in 2 to 3 days exposure to cold there is first event in the process of acclimatization to the cold in the mountain climbers or people getting exposed to the cold environments cold climates a uh, shivering thermogenesis which occurred initially is shifted to non shivering thermogenesis shift from shivering thermogenesis to non shivering thermogenesis that is the process of acclimatization to the cold now non shivering thermogenesis in infants and newborn baby uh, was by brown adipose tissue 
non shivering thermogenesis in adults occurs by increased secretion of thyroxin that's the way of non shivering heat production increased thyroxin levels will increase the bmr and that will generate more heat in the body that's non shivering thermogenesis so uh, that's the process of acclimatization shivering uh, giving way to non shivering thermogenesis that's the first criteria for acclimatization to the cold so that's uh, these are some of the the important mechanisms of heat production heat loss and temperature regulation let me just add in the end the applied aspect of this uh for instance uh, exposure to extreme cold leading to vasoconstriction in the digits of the hand and feet the resultant condition is described as the frostbite the mountain climbers are at a risk of this frostbite um and the, on the uh, so hypothermia frostbite these are the conditions on one extreme when the temperature is too low the increased temperature let me talk about the fever particularly why some fevers are associated with chills and rigors look temperature regulating system temperature regulating neurons are in the hypothalamus and they behave like a thermostat they have a certain set point so if the blood temperature in their milieu has increased it's brought back to the normal to to their set point if the temperature was decreased that is brought back to the set point so set point it the hypothalamic neurons work on the principle of the set point they have a set point of 38 degree centigrade uh now when the fever happens what happens really is that there are certain bacteria or other microorganisms they release pyrogens fever producing substances and those pyrogens may cause cell membrane injury resulting in prostaglandins and there is release of interleukin 1 locally in the hypothalamic neurons and this chain of prostaglandin interleukin 1 what it achieves is that it increase it raises the set point of the hypothalamic neurons i mean if it is normally 98 degrees fahrenheit these pyrogens and the interleukin 1 would raise it to 99 or 100 degrees fahrenheit what will be the result now this is the new set point so now the body temperature uh, has to be set at 100 100 degree fahrenheit because the set point has been increased that is why in spite of the fact that we have such an excellent temperature regulating system in the body i mean as i mentioned at the start a temperature regulating system is one of the most efficient systems in the body in terms of homeostasis and yet people suffer from fever why because it works on the the hypothalamic neurons work in the principle of thermostat or uh, with a set point now imagine this now let me just explain in the end why certain fevers are associated with chills and rigors consider this that the hypothalamic set point has been raised to 100 degrees fahrenheit there is a fever that is ongoing and now suddenly after taking uh, some antipyretic or because of the of the cycle of that microbe if suddenly the temperature comes down now what happens is hypothalamic set point was raised to 100 but the body temperature and blood temperature has come back to 98 so now the body systems will start thinking that no the normal temperature has to be 100 that means this 98 is abnormal and the body temperature needs to be increased and raised to 100 and in that attempt there is there are chills and rigors rhythmic involuntary jerky contractions of the muscles that will generate heat in the body so this 
uh, always looks paradoxical that uh, there is a fever, it should be decreased, but chills and rigors actually are going to increase the body temperature. Why? That's the reason because the hypothalamic set point of the thermostat was raised and that's why fever came in the first place. But if the temperature is suddenly dropped after that, then there will be chills and rigors. So it's a huge topic. My initial goal for this topic was to just discuss the temperature regulating systems of the body and how the body reacts in the face of heat and cold, exposure to heat and cold. So that in a nutshell is the temperature, the stress of temperature and reaction by the body.